Welcome back to Left Anchor. I'm Alexi the Greek. And I'm Ryan Cooper. So today on the podcast, we have John Shelton, professor at the uh, University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, and author of the book, The Education Myth, How Human Capital Trumps, uh, Trumped Social Democracy, which is available in bookstores today. Um, and Not to mention a colleague and friend of Friend of the Pod, Harvey J.K., who, uh, you know, works closely or, you know, before Harvey retired, especially works closely with uh, Professor Shelton there at Green Bay, Wisconsin. And uh, yeah. yeah, do all kinds of good stuff together at that university. Also, we should say jo John Shelton, a not just a participant, but a one of the few winners of the Left Anchor uh, Leftist Podcast Play Fantasy Football League. So uh, congratulations to John for winning the Fantasy Football League. Yeah. Yeah. He owned us. Uh, well, you, Alexi, <laughs> I have no idea how fantasy football works and I have not participated. But that's okay. I represent you in that yeah. uh, capacity. So it's still us. We that's both lost. That's right. You're my proxy. And we have uh, Asian principal problems probably out the wazoo. <laughs> I think that John won because he was getting backhanders from... Uh, a certain somebody no but uh <laughs> at any rate so the 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 interview is is about you know john's work on how the the political function of education i guess i would i would characterize it you know how how people used to think about education back in the day how uh education has become a sort of political tool in the in the arsenal of neoliberalism and conservatism uh from you know more or less like the 1970s up to the present day and what might be done about that um and so it's a it's a super interesting conversation and i think highly relevant to yes. the discussion about you know both like what we should do about student debt and also, you know, Ron DeSantis turning uh, Florida into a sort of totalitarian, uh, you know, nightmare hell where, you know, the, the only schools will be the DeSantis youth uh, <laughs> saluting the right. meatball Ron uh, day in and day out. No, it, it certainly situates today's uh, political uh, contestation and divides and traces it back to, uh, you know, all the way back to the founding, but then, you know, prominently yep. uh, the 20th century uh, as well, because social democracy and social and public goods and understandings of positive freedom more generally, um, you know, this is something that we've fought for uh, in our history and something we need to continue to fight for because the neoliberal um, decimation of the public good of education and the transformation of it into mere job training and, and making, uh, you know, individuals morally and economically responsible for their own, uh, you know, survival, let alone success in our political economy, that that's a thing that serves a very particular function for capitalism. And the, the way to combat that is to understand the, the history and the proper situ situating of education in terms of its role in um, making citizens who understand how to fight against power and, and, and understand how to uh, come together for freedom, equality, and justice. So uh, really important, really timely. And I think the book is, is actually a super accessible uh, history that, um, that is really relevant, you know, so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so before we get to the interview, a couple of quick notes uh, that this podcast now is sponsored by the American Prospect magazine. Um, so if you go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash left acre and subscribe at the $10 a month tier, uh, you'll get a free digital subscription to the website as well as a discounted print subscription if you would like it. Um, if you subscribe at the $5 a month tier, uh, you'll get access to all our bonus episodes. And also that comes along with the $10 a month. And I forgot to mention that. Uh, but otherwise, you can um, rate, review, share with your friends, uh, or just enjoy the listening experience here uh on the left anchor <laughs> luxurious bonus uh that's true uh, 
That's true. Extreme luxury podcast experience. <laughs> By the way, if you really want to show the transphobes what's up, uh, you know, the TERFs have been, uh, you know, bombing us with bad ratings on Apple. That That uh, is true. So, so is feel that, free to yeah. balance, balance that out if, if you don't mind. Yeah. Do, do, do politics by giving us a five-star review on Apple Politics. <laughs> show those Apple TERFs Podcast. what's up. Yeah. That that may, in fact, be a legitimately positive uh, thing that you could do in the world. <laughs> what a sad state of affairs that is. Uh, but let's stop goofing around and get uh, to our interview with John Shelton right now. So, um, welcome to the show, John. Uh, you know your your book. It's it's got a lot to it, and you know I want to get into the 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 meat of the substance. Uh, but before before we do that, um, you you have a sort of like your table setting kind of introductory chapter is about education. Um, in the early Republic in the United States in the 19th century. Um, so to, to sort of uh, lay the groundwork for what you talk about, you know, sort of main argument of the book, could you, could you explain that to it? Because I think that is very foreign to, to modern audience, the, the way that uh, uh, Americans and even American politicians thought about education, the purpose of education and why you would do things like set up the land grant colleges in the, the 1860s, right, if, if I remember correctly. Um, what was that all about? Yeah. So when I first started writing this book, I, I didn't think I was going to go back to like the founding of the nation. That, <laughs> that, that's, that seemed like kind of a foolhardy enterprise for me because I'm a historian who does 20th century especially after 1945. I mean, my first book is on the 1970s specifically. Um, but as I, as I started thinking about it, uh, you know, I, 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 I knew about this kind of idea that Americans had about education and this idea that like you hear this from politicians, you know, going all the way back to Carter and, and Clinton and, and both George Bush's and Obama and Biden, to a certain extent, when he was, you know, basically telling minors to go back and learn to code or whatever, that education is, you know, the reason that we have it is so that people can get good jobs. And, you know, so when I started doing the research for this, I felt like I really needed to interrogate that. And, and I'd had some ideas that that wasn't exactly why Americans wanted public education in the, in the 19th century. Because I read some really good books. Uh, there's a really good book um, about the early uh, public education by this historian named Johann Niem, which people should check out. It's called Democracy Schools. But as I as I looked at this, you know, I, I found out pretty quickly that American policymakers and, and politicians and labor unions, even in the in the 19th century. They didn't want public schools because they saw anybody as getting job skills. You know, they're they're. There's a there's an entire kind of cottage industry in the economics field now. Uh, e economists like uh, Claudia Golden and Lauren Katz, who wrote this Lawrence Katz, who wrote this book about education in the 19th century, and kind of said, you know, one of the reasons the United States becomes this economic powerhouse is because of this historic investment in public education. I'm not saying that's untrue; that there's a connection between those two things. But the reality is, when you look at what the reasons policymakers were pushing for public schools in the 19th century, it, it had nothing to do with job skills. You know, go back to Jefferson in, uh, you know, the, this sort of plan he had for public education in Virginia all the way back in the 1770s. And of course, you know, all the caveats with Jefferson aside, you know, slave owner um, certainly didn't see Af African-Americans or Native Americans as, as being capable of, of education. But nonetheless, saw the necessity of expanding the system of uh, or creating a system of public education really in Virginia. And the idea was to train people to be citizens, to understand how democracy works, to be able to, to challenge power structures. Actually, Jefferson explicitly wrote about that, that, you know, the United States was this country that was formed uh, in a, in a, out of this, you know, monarchical system and kind of needed to be on, 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 on their toes. American citizens need to be on their toes for the upsurge of tyranny. And so um, you take that into the into the 19th century and you've got education reformers like Horace Mann, this Whig politician who pushes for public education in Massachusetts. Again, not about job skills at all. Uh, Mann almost uh, barely mentions job skills until kind of the end of his career as an education reformer. And then, you know, pretty much only grudgingly, you know, the, the argument for public schools was that they would 
again, help people be citizens in, in a democracy. Sometimes there was kind of a social control element. I mean, one of the things Mann wrote about was that, you know, the excesses of the French Revolution would have never happened and it, you know, would have never happened there if they had an education system that actually like trained them to be responsible citizens. So I'm not saying it's all, you know, kind of uh, Pollyanna-ish and, and this, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, Edenic, you know, form of public education. But it, I felt like it was really important to establish this because what this means is that for the vast majority of American history, Americans were not pushing for public education in, in order for people to get job skills. And that's important because if, if that hasn't always been the case, then it makes it much more likely that we can change how we think about education and, and the function of it. So I felt like it was really important to establish that. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think you've, you've kind of referenced it uh, there, but, but what is the education myth that you're, that you're talking about in the book? Yeah. So, all right. So you've got this, this 19th century where the big push for public education is connected to citizenship and by the way, that actually includes a lot of unions, as I alluded to earlier, uh, working men's organizations in places like New York and Pennsylvania in the 1820s and 1830s were pushing for public education, in part because uh, you know they, they wanted to keep children out of the workforce, but also because they wanted to train new generations of, of citizens to be able to challenge you know power hierarchies and, and to be able to form strong unions, etc. So... Uh, when you start to have the emergence of this, which probably just about everybody listening to this knows about this um, labor problem in the 19th century, the, the fact that more and more Americans were working for wages in terrible conditions, um, you know, the emergence of in the late 19th century, uh, what we would call the Gilded Age, the primary way that working people fought for more economic security was through forming unions and uh, and other kinds of economic reforms, child labor laws, right, eight hour workday, um, minimum wages, those kind of things. And so, in many ways, the New Deal is kind of the the fruition of that push, right? I mean, the Roosevelt administration, along with you know some other really important reformers like Francis Perkins, Secretary of Labor, uh, Robert Wagner, the senator from New York who authors the National Labor Relations Act. You know, they're, they're, they're responding to these decades and decades of organizing from working people. And, you know, so the, so the New Deal kind of institutionalizes that idea. Um, and that really kind of structures American politics, the mainstream of American politics from like the 30s through the, you know, 50s into the 60s. But the education myth is, you know, this, this idea and it, and it stems from something that's real, right? Which is that, when working people do get more skills, it does allow them to do other things. And it, in certain circumstances, can allow people to get higher wages. But uh, what it does is it, it kind of um, takes that kernel of an idea and uh, made it, I argue, you know, that it comes from these two economists from the University of Chicago, uh, largely Theodore Schultz and Gary Becker, and allows politicians, especially Democrats, to kind of say, well, maybe we don't need these other really big social reforms if we just invest in the education system. It's a much more kind of palatable fix to big political problems, even though it's not a real fix to, to political problems, right? Which is why I sort of call it a myth. So in the 1960s, when the Johnson administration, um, you know, creates the Great Society, which I think many of us probably look back on and see as this really important period of reform. And in many ways, it was, of course, right? We've got the Civil Rights Move, you know, Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in there. They're really, really important during those years. We've got Medicare and Medicaid, you know, closest thing we have to universal health care in this country. You know, I think all of us would agree that that's great. But another big part of the great society was this idea that if people are poor, whether that's African-Americans in uh, inner cities or, you know, sort of rural white people, that they're poor because they don't have the right skills, right? They don't have the, the right education, not that there aren't jobs available for them or that discrimination has shut them out of the labor market or that they don't have unions, right? And so um, you kind of start with that, that you know, kind of tension around big social reforms and education as the economic equalizer in the 1960s. And what I argue is that those two ideas kind of um, continue in tandem, kind of competing with each other into the 60s and 70s, but that at a certain point, Political choices by Democrats, and, and we can talk more about this, Carter looms large, Clinton, of course, looms large too, 
um, start to increasingly kind of weigh the scales toward the, the kind of education argument while they're doing things that are, especially when you get to Clinton, actively harming working people like negotiating NAFTA. So the education myth is this idea that it, as if, you know, by magic, education will help anybody, you know, who uh, is struggling to gain economic security in the labor market. It can sort of magically help them overcome all the structural impediments that exist. And it's and it's become so pervasive now in our politics, or at least until very recently, that it's it's um, difficult for people to, to recognize any other kind of alternative. This is great, John. There's so much to, to disentangle there. Um, but it occurs to me that your history is so important because, you know, there's a general trajectory uh, of the fight for freedom and equality through our history and the struggle against kind of the ideals of the Declaration and the realities of, you know, genocide and slavery and Jim Crow. Um, but the the move and the, tw- the, the kind of struggle for some social democracy in the 20th century uh loses out to neoliberalism. And it seems to me that the myth of the education myth that you d- describe is is one part of that story that really needs to be understood in the context of the overall story, right? And so the, the myth, at you, as you describe, is also the myth that um, you can disaggregate education from these other social and public goods and, and these positive freedoms that you describe uh, are rightly should rightly be understood as part of the promise of the Declaration, right? Um, so maybe we can talk a bit about that because the the neoliberal problem that you're you're talking about with the education myth of shifting moral responsibility and even economic accountability to the individual and their their need for job training and skills is importantly understood in tandem with the. Uh, decimation, not just of unions, uh, but public goods more generally, and that role of education as part of a check against power and part of forming citizens who have the capacity to self-govern and collectively govern, right? Yeah, that, that that's such a good question. And, you know, I, I want to just say at the outset, you, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that the, the education myth is, you know, kind of the only reason that neoliberalism, you know, beats labor liberalism, right? I just want to kind of make sure that that's clear. Yeah. I know you're not suggesting that, but, you know, I think sometimes we write, as historians, we write these kind of books and get dinged for like, oh, this is a, you know, kind of over overarching monolithic Theory of everything. Kind of argument. <laughs> this is not, the one. Right, this book not, is the only one you need. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Not not saying that at all. There's a lot of other books that you need to read. Uh, but go back to the late 1940s with the Truman Commission, right? The, this, this commission that obviously President Truman c- convenes on higher education. And, um, you know, it's, it's really fascinating because – the Truman Commission essentially argues for free, at least two years of free college tuition. And it's, and it's, and it's fascinating because, you know, the way that there's lots of good arguments for free, you know, college tuition now, I, I support them. But too often we kind of hear these arguments couched in uh, the economic necessity of a college degree, right? You've got to get a college degree if you're going to have any chance in the labor market. To a certain extent, that's true, but it's not entirely true. And, and in fact, more and more college graduates now are not succeeding in the labor market, which we can get, get into. But that's not the argument the Truman Commission made at all. What they argued was that, uh, you know, t- tuition free college was important because Americans needed to understand the world around them. They needed to be trained as citizens, particularly in the Cold War context, that the world was much more complex after World War II. And if the United States was going to have new generations of citizens that could navigate it, they needed college. So that, I, that idea is very much embedded in, you know, the kind of this, this labor, liberal, New Deal moment, whatever you want to call it. Um, but some really important things happened in the 1970s. And, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I actually knew nothing about when I started researching this book and I just found it was the construction of the Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Education. And, I, and there's a chapter that in the middle of the book that deals with this pretty extensively. I think when I, to the extent that I knew about this, I didn't know that this was actually controversial at the time. This happened in the Carter administration. The Department of Education was formed in 1979. Of course, Reagan, when he comes into office, immediately tries to abolish it, but couldn't do it. The education department used to be in a cabinet department called uh, Housing, Education, and Welfare. And those three things were very much linked together. If you think about something like FDR's Economic Bill of Rights and having, you know, all these sort of things like housing and the right to a job and education all being connected, you can see how HEW became a cabinet department. 
And, you know, the 1970s were this just really pivotal time. So on, very similar to our time, actually, working people were increasingly getting having difficulty in, in the in the labor market. Inflation was going through the roof. But at the same time, you, right, you had unemployment inflation at the same time. And Democrats in the mid 1970s were pushing hard for a jobs guarantee. That was something that Hubert Humphrey was pushing for. Coretta Scott King, Martin's widow. Well, this was this was her sort of major cause in the 1970s. And she said, this is this is Martin's legacy. Um, and you have this bill called the Humphrey Hawkins uh, Act, co-authored by Humphrey and, and Augustus Hawkins, this representative fr- from the Watts. He represented Watts in Los Angeles and said, you know, key to civil rights is ensuring everybody has the right to a job. Look at the Democratic Party platform in 1976. The right to a job is like front and center. And then you get this sort of new generation of Democrats. And, you know, I know right now, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter is, is having health issues and, and everybody is sort of reflecting on his time. But I think we have to think about what his true legacy was on American politics. And Carter was very uninterested as sort of a new Democrat, right? Was, was very uninterested in a job, a meaningful version of a jobs guarantee. He was very uninterested in labor reform that was absolutely necessary. But the one thing he would do, Right. Um, Humphrey Hawkins gets passed, but it's a sort of weakened version, doesn't guarantee anybody a job. The one thing he would do is create a new cabinet level department for education. Uh, lots of Democrats in Congress, especially labor Democrats, opposed it. Albert Shanker from the AFT opposed it. Shirley Chisholm, uh, uh, African American, uh, you know, representative from New York, opposed it. Um, and it barely passed. It barely got through the House, actually. And the, so you kind of have this moment where, you know, I'm not saying a Department of Education is necessarily bad if it comes with all of these other reforms that are necessary for everybody, whether they have a college degree or not to have a good life. But it kind of symbolically took education and literally stripped it away from these other social rights that were absolutely necessary. And I think that was a really, really important moment for that reason. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. This poverty question, I think, is worth drilling down into a little bit. Um you know, because you 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 heard this as you said, you know, from Carter, from the Atari Democrats, you know, the the first generation. Which, of, can we pause? Can we pause with that? the Atari Democrats? Is a great phrase. Come on, that's a great. It's some some it is. some it is. Uh, a vibrant branding at least. You know, the the slogan <laughs> has stuck, even though nobody knows what Atari is anymore. I was going to say for some of our audience, we might have to explain what Atari is. I guess it's still around, but you know, anyway, like. From then up until through the Obama administration, you had Arne Duncan, the secretary of education, saying stuff like, you know, the best uh, weapon against poverty is uh, education. And, you know, uh, my buddy Matt Brunig, friend of the pod, uh, you know, half of his career in, you know, writing and, and, and journalism and whatnot has been just blowing this notion completely out of the water, specifically with respect to poverty. Uh, you look at poverty, what causes poverty is inability to work. You know, it's like you have a classical capitalist system. Well, who gets income under capitalism? Workers and owners of property. Uh, you know, that's it. And so the the what causes poverty, by and large, with rare exceptions, is People being in a status in their lives, a, 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 a particular stage of life, or having some sort of problem where they cannot work or they do not own anything, which is almost everybody. You know, the, we're talking about ownership. That's the rich people. Uh, the super majority, something like 80, 85 percent of poor people are uh, children, students, unemployed people disabled people, um, and, uh, and, uh, the elderly. And the answer to this in your sort of social democratic context is to set up the welfare state, the welfare state through the government sends out income to all the categories of people who can't work. You have your, you know, your sort of qualifying thing. You have a child allowance, you have a, a student allowance, you have uh, pension benefits. We even have that in the United States, social security, it's not great by Nordic standards, but it does exist. And it has cut elderly poverty by like 75% uh, relative to where it was. So, you know, this is from a, from like a very obvious 
uh, uh, analysis of how the economy works. Like, where are the dollars and cents flowing throughout throughout the population? Obviously, you know, you're not going to get the children uh, to be able to like work at jobs at Facebook, you know, because they're five years old. This is not a thing. Um, so we need to set up income streams for all those types of people. It's like half the population, by the way, who, who works. It's only about half the population that works, about half the population doesn't. And that includes almost everyone at one point or another. We all young, we all lose our jobs occasionally. Most of us, uh, we could all become disabled at any point in time. It could strike anyone and we all get old and die. Um, and so, you know, it's as much a life cycle thing as it is about like the, you know, the poor, the disadvantaged people, you know, who, who are really struggling, homeless people and whatnot. Uh, you know, th this is about like spreading out our income over our life cycle from when we're in our forties and making lots of money, you know, uh, relative to previous times in our lives and moving that around paying for each other so that we can all have like a decent standard of living and education. I think as, as you're saying in the book is a sort of just a political gimmick. It's a way to uh, dissolve the class conflict inherent in the welfare state analysis, which is to say, if we want to get rid of poverty, we need to tax the rich and, and everyone else to a lesser extent. We need to spread the money around. And, it, and the education people come in and say, no, no, what we need to do is let's not look at who the actual poor people are. What we need to do is we need to increase the skills of society. And you, and you saw this in the post 2008, uh, you know, the, the, the economy was in the toilet, you know, you had 10% unemployment in 2010. And then you had president Obama out there saying, well, nobody can get jobs because there's a skills gap, not that there aren't enough jobs available. And so and there's no such thing as a skills gap. Yeah. Speak to this, like the ideological function of education as saying, you know, like setting aside whether education is good or not. I, I think we all could agree. Education is great. It should be available for, for everybody, but to say that it can resolve the conflicts, the class conflicts in a capitalist society by like, oh, if only the homeless people would learn to code, then we wouldn't have to have any more taxes <laughs> on the rich. That's nonsense, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So there's like 20 things I want to respond to there. Uh, first Sorry. of all, are, are you sure that Mark Zuckerberg hasn't proposed employing five-year-olds? <laughs> He, he may have. Yeah. <laughs> I, they, I could I could see him doing They could that. sell their blood to Peter Thiel. You know, I'm sure he'd give them a good there rate. There you go. I mean, we should get yeah. back to the to, to the resurgence in child labor these days. That is probably <laughs> worth getting into. Yeah. yeah, actually. I mean, that's so disturbing. Um okay, so there's so many places we could go, but let's let's go to the nineteen sixties for one minute, okay? Because I talked about Johnson and I said you know, we've got these big reforms that happened in the 1960s, things like the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which provide federal funding to K-12 schools and are meant to uh, be compensatory to compensate for uh, schools with higher numbers of impoverished students. Uh, we've got the Higher Education Act, which actually in some ways starts us on the path to student the student loan crisis, even though it's meant to expand access to higher education. You know, we've got various job training schemes in the Great Society, right? And so you have all these things there. At the same time, you also have an alternative to that, which is Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph's Freedom Budget, which does exactly what you just said, uh, which says, no, the root cause of poverty isn't that people don't have the right job skills. The root cause of poverty is because people don't have jobs and good houses and good education systems uh, and the infrastructure where they live. And so, you know, the, the, the freedom budget was really genius because this was at a time when the United States was very prosperous. And what Randolph and Rustin said was, let's use some portion of the, you know, wealth that this economy is creating and, and poverty, but do it in a way that's going to help everybody, right? Whites and blacks. But of course, Randolph knew that it would disproportionately help African Americans because they were poor, right? And so it would do things like, ensure that people had jobs, rebuilding infrastructure, rebuilding homes for people, all of these things that you're talking about and, and, and actually do something about this, this question of poverty in a meaningful way. And, you know, to the point about, uh, education as this, this kind of way to elide class differences, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, one of the things that I talk about Ryan in the, in, in the book, uh, in the subtitle of the book, right? It's, it's the subtitle is how human capital trumps social democracy. 
And that term human capital is really, really important. Yeah. Um, because, because, um, the way that economists talked about this, the way that Schultz and Becker and others talked about this in the fifties and sixties, when this term was coined, uh, Schultz actually said, you know, and think about how crazy this is. This is in the 1950s when you've got workers forming unions, you know, uh, the great compression, um, at, you know, more and more as, as, uh, I think it was Claudia Golden who actually came up with that term. Uh, the Great Compression, where economic inequality is is becoming lessened because of progressive taxation and and labor unions and government spending, and what what Schultz actually says, and I talk about this in the book, is he says, actually the reason that there's more widespread, uh, more widespread equality is because workers are getting more skills, and in that sense, they're getting a, like their human capital is giving them sort of an ownership stake in capitalism. It's 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 so fascinating, and. That term itself, human capital, you think about it, uh, it, 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 it does – I use this term in the book. It does alchemical work actually, right? It, it, it makes somebody feel like who is labor. They are labor. If you are human capital, you are selling your labor to somebody else. You're not – by definition, you cannot be capital, right? Capital is ownership <laughs> where you are profiting from other people's labor. But this idea of human capital is that like I'm going to acquire more capital, more job skills for myself and then I can sell my value. I, I can sell my labor for a higher value and it totally makes everybody into like some uh, uh, fictitious form of an individual capitalist or something, right? And 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 it completely elides the class dynamics which are that, again, I'm selling my labor to somebody else. Even if I'm a, uh, you know, a highly elite athlete, you know, like – uh, you know, we've got baseball spring training happening right now. And you look at the work that these men are doing, right, right, to, to get ready for the season that, you know, their, their human capital might be, you know, training, learning how to throw new pitches, et cetera, you know, in, in spring training, but they're still selling their labor and somebody else is still making a profit from them. And, and that's really what we're talking about here and, and, and how the kind of sleight of hand becomes so problematic in, in, in American politics because it, it tells workers that they're, they're failures because they didn't get the right education. They didn't get the right human capital. And if they had, if they had just, you know, majored in engineering instead of, instead of majoring in, you know, liberal arts, some liberal arts degree in college, they'd be successful right now. So it, so it, it just puts all of the uh, explanation for the the problems with our systems on with our system onto the individuals. It's it's monumentally uh, uh, powerful and problematic. Yeah, and it, I was going to say it puts the onus on them. I always thought that sounds gross. Don't put the onus on me. Gross. <laughs> uh, but in any case, uh, the, the athlete example is really good because a lot of my students often who support capitalism will point to you know LeBron James deserves all that money, and you know. He is still a worker, though. They're admiring a, a super talented worker who himself is getting totally exploited by the owners who don't do any work and like are making so much more money off of LeBron. And so like when I situate it like that for them, th then they can still understand it. But they, they buy into this idea that like I like LeBron can be my own business. It's like, you know, Wendy Brown talks about like entrepreneurship of the self, you know, it's like I, 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 my human yep. capital is being invested in, in my person, which is like the business. There's like an asset that I could then, you know, I could be bought out by someone or something like that. Right. And this yep. weird myth. Uh, yeah. But what's different about professional athletes? I don't know. They're like 0.0001% of the most talented people in the, in the world with respect to what they can do, you know. And and let's add this to the mix, too. They have incredibly strong unions. Yes. Yeah. Right. Important. right? I mean, I mean, look at the history of professional athletes before they had collective bargaining. I mean, Kurt Flood, this baseball player who, you know, challenged the reserve clause in baseball, which effectively made baseball players into indentured servants every, you know, they had to sign a contract year after year with this, the initial team that drafted them. He challenged the reserve clause in, in the court system, you, challenge it, challenge it using the 13th amendment, the, <laughs> right? He said this was slavery basically. Yeah. Um, and it, and it took, it took, uh, it took the major league baseball players association, just as the, is the case with, you know, the, the basketball players association in the case of LeBron to actually get the kind of collective power to do something about that, even though these people were elite right. athletes before that. 
Yeah, that's a great point because that is the sphere where people try to make analogous this another part of the myth, meritocracy, this idea that we we can or should or it's possible to have a meritocracy. And, and like with athletics, it's like, oh, that's where the meritocracy example is perfect. But it's a great point that even there, actually, you know, worker power is is essential. Um, maybe you could talk about that, that the relationship between the, the kind of myth of meritocracy and how that feeds into the education myth and, and the political struggles that result. Yeah. So, so first of all, if, if folks listening to this don't know Michael Sandel's book, The Tyranny of Merit, I highly recommend you, you read that. That's a, that's a really phenomenal book. Um, and you know, what, what, what this, this system of meritocracy does is again, it, it makes people feel like, um, you know, they're responsible for their own fates, but you have to think about how many things are actually out of people's control. And the, and the reality is almost everything is out of your control. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I I'd sometimes do this exercise with first year students at UW Green Bay. And, you know, I, 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 you know, kind of ask them why they're at UW Green Bay and, and, uh, you know, what they're doing there and how come they're not at Harvard and whether they're going to take out debt and all these things. And I, and I asked them just in a very simple exercise, I was like, how many of you, uh, picked your parents? <laughs> right. And I mean, of course it's a ridiculous question. Nobody picked their parents, but you know, 90, 90 to 95% of, you know, the, the reason that students are at different institutions or in college at all are, has to do with the family that you're raised in. Uh, you know, um, to go back to the 1960s, I mean, one of the reasons that, that so many African Americans in, you know, those urban areas like Watts and Detroit, where you had these insurrections, uh, am among the black community, you know, they were in places where geographically there simply weren't any jobs. That wasn't their fault, right? That was the, that was the product of a whole host of things, government decisions to make it easier for capital to move, uh, you know, the lack of investment in urban infrastructure, uh, racism, right. Going back hundreds of years. So the, the reality is that, you know, almost everything in the labor market is actually outside of our control. Um, being a public employee here in Wisconsin, I don't have the right to collectively bargain. If I lived in Illinois, I would have the right to collectively bargain. That's not my fault, right? That's, you know, and, and that, that's when I, when I think about what's happened to the UW system, you know, and there, that's, this is a whole other conversation, but there's, there's so many people leaving right now because the system has been defunded because of political choices. If we had collective bargaining, we could do more about that, but we live in a state that doesn't have that. And, and nobody chose to have that history. And so there, those are just a few examples, but there's so many different things outside of your control. What kind of skills are in demand? You know, um, you think about the skills that would have been more, more in demand, like engineering skills, for example, that are you know, in demand right now, um, you know, th those were things that, you know, maybe weren't as much in demand 50 years ago. Right. So, so these are things that's, it, these are things that are all outside of our control, but this idea that somehow navigating the labor market is in our control is, is so problematic. And it, and it, and not only does it, does it, uh, lead to people to internalize things that are not their fault, it leads them to, to feel disempowered because they've many, many times they bought into the idea that if they're responsible for this and if they had made better individual choices, they could do something about it. And that prevents them from actually taking the kind of actions that are necessary to overturn this, this kind of unfair, you know, labor market that we have in this country. Well, that just reminds me that like part of the success of neoliberalism is in, and with respect to education, the fact that you have this quote unquote right to work state of Wisconsin is a result of politics, which itself could be influenced by educated citizens who understand their interest actually and understand what is out of their control, but what could be within their control politically if they were motivated and, and worked to those ends. Um, so neoliberalism loves to, to make people apathetic and, and, and not political. And, and, and so that, like that there is a certain function of that conception of education that is, uh, that is the corollary of the kind of egalitarian liberatory function of education, which in like the Paulo Freire sense, right. Uh, gets people to realize what power is doing and move towards changing it. Right. No, a hundred percent. And, you know, this, this whole standards based education movement, accountability movement, which started, you know, actually Clinton, um, in the, in the late eighties was a big part of pushing for this back when he was the governor of Arkansas and part of the democratic governors association pushing for education reform, uh, largely because these democratic governors in particular, but some Republicans too, 
were, were seeking to kind of find a lane for themselves apart from Reagan, this, this sort of extremely crass kind of market fundamentalism. And, and so they were looking for a way to kind of, I mean, I'll use this word anachronistically because Clinton didn't use it until the mid nineties, but kind of triangulate, right? And, and so, uh, you know, Clinton's pushing for education reform and accountability in the nineties. But then it's no child left behind that that really crystallizes it and, and just compl- I mean I, I think it, no child left behind has done so much damage to the education system because the premise is force schools to be accountable to a certain kind of knowledge and give teachers less flexibility to be able to teach those kinds of things to teach kids to be discerning citizens in a democracy and it's not a surprise that like the Republican Party now has gone sort of completely. Uh, off the rails in terms of education. I mean, if you look at, I, I'm sure your listeners know about this, but the kind of things DeSantis is doing, you know, all of these fields that they don't want anybody to talk about, th- th- this idea that that they're making a good faith interpretation about American history is such a red herring, I, right? I mean, like, you know, I, I think we all have our criticisms of American history on the left, but, you know, I, I think the, the promise of the uh, Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, these are things that we should absolutely be valuing. And we have a tradition of that going through Frederick Douglass through Martin Luther King and Eugene Debs. So nobody's saying like we can't, you know, we can't find anything good in the, in the you know, American Revolution and, you know, and, and, and that's what DeSantis is, is uh, defending. What he's actually trying to do is to prevent people from, from studying anything that isn't kind of narrow – job training, right? It's, we don't want people studying, you know, women and gender studies or African-American studies, um, you know, or, or anything that's going to make people actually challenge the kind of power structures that exist. So yeah, this is, this is all, and by this point, it's become totally by design, even if it wasn't initially, at least on the right. Yeah. And I mean, the thing about what DeSantis is, is clearly doing, which is like to sort of just eviscerate public, public education across the board to turning it into a sort of like vocational school in an explicit sense, you know, nothing against Votech type of education, you know, like that, that can be very useful, but to, to just say like, there should be no higher purpose whatsoever in terms of like creating an educated citizenry that can like absolutely actually grapple with our history and, you know, like what, uh, informed, uh, population should be, you know, thinking about things, uh, it builds on the legacy of democratic neoliberal education reform, which is that the purpose of the education system is to stamp out workers that can serve as reliable employees for whatever sector happens to be most profitable at the moment. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's it's. I mean, I wouldn't pin the blame entirely on the Democrats, of course, like, uh, but they, they really do seem to have like, uh, d- just, just committed a tremendous, uh, political, uh, blunder, both in terms of, you know, the false promise of get a degree and you will for sure be guaranteed a, a, a higher income and also enabling this right wing assault on, um, education writ large. Yeah. And, you know, the, the problem with the Democratic Party, you know, there's many problems. <laughs> and I, and I say this as a, as a Democrat. Uh, okay. Um, you know, the, the, the problem though, going back to the 1970s, and I document in this book and I document that in this book. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, uh, I learned a lot in terms of this argument from, uh, Lily Geismer's book. Uh, about the the way that the Democratic Party kind of became captured by the professional class in the 1970s, you know, um, the 70s is so transformative. You know, it it it, it really um, that you know kind of first half of the 1970s transformed the Democratic Party in so many ways. When you have these professional class dem- professional class people basically like forming the center of the party moving forward, people don't think about that because they kind of you know often think about the Democratic Party as sort of being this monolith. But, um, you know, Biden, Biden's a great example of that, right? He gets elected in 1972. Um, there's a whole generation of Democrats elected in 74 in the, in the wake of Watergate, the Watergate babies. Um, Gary Hart, this, remember we talked about Atari Democrats. He's sort of the quintessential Atari Democrat, uh, you know, gets elected to the Senate in that year. And, and these, these people are pushing, these new Democrats are, they see themselves as being responsive to a constituency of people with college degrees. So 
they're not as interested in things like a jobs guarantee, in labor reform. In fact, they see labor unions uh, in some ways as this kind of um, archaic, uh, anti uh, merit- meritocratic institution, right? Because the idea is that they're protecting people who maybe aren't working as hard as other people, right? I'm not saying I think that's true, but I'm saying that's kind of how they look at it. And so the problem with that as a political strategy <laughs> is that the majority of Americans don't have college degrees. I mean, e- even in terms of the, the the morals of that, which is okay. So, what do you do about you know if your argu- if your answer for everything is to tell people to get a college degree, um, you know what do you what do you do for the sixty five seventy even if you you know have great educational outcomes and can get more people to graduate from college at, at best what fifty percent of American workers who don't have college degrees right. So what do you do with them? And that that kind of strategy has essentially said to a lot of blue collar people and a lot of white collar people too. Without again degrees as service sector workers, like we don't have anything for you, right? Like you yeah. you, you should you should go out and get the right the, the right job. And so it, that's been kind of disastrous because you you know especially when you have professional class people who are increasingly. Um, living in the same geographic areas and you have an electoral college, which is necessary to win elections, you know, just sort of ignoring all those people has has been deeply problematic, even if it's not, I mean, I I think it's problematic for moral reasons, but even if you don't think that for sort of political reasons, it's problematic. And they go together. Let's talk about that a little bit, right? Because you, you, you write about, I mean, a lot of the failures uh, in in this country are failures of uh, liberalism to, uh, (laughs) to not, Go with the leftists, the social democrats and the socialists who, who understand properly what freedom really entails and instead have like a symbiotic relationship with the reactionary right. So talk about, you know, Scott Walker, Trump and, and kind of build on what you were saying there that this kind of myth, uh, this education myth that neoliberals, uh, you know, brought to bear on, um, Americans everywhere fed into uh, not just economic distress, but a kind of resentment that allowed uh, like Scott Walker and Trump to, to have a kind of reactionary populism, if we can call it that, that succeeded to just make things worse. Yeah. So by way of doing that, I want to just take a quick detour to the 1930s. All right. And 1936 is this pivotal election in American history because it's, it's, you know, Roosevelt's reelection, it's after the really most of the reforms of the New Deal, right? They happen in that first term. 35, of course, is this huge year. We get the Wagner Act. We get the Social Security Act. Uh, we get um, actually um, a massive expansion of jobs uh, through uh, public works. And we get graduated income, steeply graduated income tax. All that stuff happens in 1935. So it's this huge year. FDR in 36 at his um, convention speech in Philly, actually, right, gives this speech where he calls out the economic royalists and he says, you know, basically like, you know, he's he's doing a victory lap and saying like this election is going to kind of ratify the things that that we've been doing over the past four years. And it does, hu- you know, huge electoral college win. And 36 is the is the is the year that the party is realigned and it becomes a party truly of working people. This is when African Americans start voting for Roosevelt in large number or Democrats in large numbers. Um, this is where most of the nation's working class votes Democrat. And 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 what do those years have in com- common? Right, the the FDR years and then to a certain extent Truman and and into the 1950s, Democratic Party put working class issues front and center. Economic security for working people was there was a, a laser focus on that. And it's not a surprise that the Democratic Party became this massively important party, right? Or the, you know, the massively dominant party. All kinds of, I, I don't want to be Pollyannish about it, of course, right? We know African Americans were, were left out of, especially in the early New Deal, many things. Um, but, you know, fought to rectify that. That was a big part of Randolph's legacy. So, you know, that that's kind of the quintessential example of what I think Democrats should have been doing for the past like 20 or 30 years. And, you know, and Wisconsin is a good example of how we've kind of paid the price for that. So Wisconsin has this great progressive tradition. Uh, read uh, Dan Kaufman's book, The Fall of Wisconsin. If you don't know about this, that's a terrific book. Um, first state in the in one of the you know, one of the first states to have pretty robust labor rights you know, right after the Wagner Act happens in the in the, in the private sector, uh, in the public sector, we're the first state that has public sector uh, collective bargaining rights back in the late 1950s. 
Um, and so, uh, but, but it's a state that's not a professional class state, right? I mean, the, the, the vast majority and go, go to the 20 teens, it's a blue collar state, a lot of agricultural, uh, folks. Um, most people don't have college degrees is what I'm saying. Right. So wh- 2010 Walker runs for, uh, governor. And, uh, of course this is right after 2008. There are, uh, uh, there are industrial plants, you know, outfits that are, you know, figuring out what to do in the wake of this uh, economic crisis. And and so one of the quintessential examples of that is this company called Mercury Marine, which is a, you know, they make, uh, uh, you know, outboard motors and things like that. They're based out in Fond du Lac, which is, you know, somewhat close to me, about an hour away. I used to have one of those. And um, yeah, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, and essentially the Democratic governor has to be, has to bail them out to keep them from like, doesn't actually have to bail them out, but like gives them this huge sweetener to keep them, keep the jobs here. Walker running for governor on the campaign trail says, if I'm governor, Mercury Marine's not even going to think about leaving. Uh, he says, I'm going to keep these jobs here because the business climate's going to be so good. And then, right. And this is a state that's been deeply impacted by NAFTA, right? One of the states that was most impacted by NAFTA actually. And people felt that, you know, at the time, uh, he says, The public employees, all those people who still have good pensions, good health care, right? These things the government's paying for, they're the haves and all the private sector workers are the have nots, right? Because those people have been feeling pain. They're having to take concessions if they are able to keep their jobs in these sort of industries. And Walker just drives that wedge right in there and says, I'm going to do something about this. And, you know, even though he he gets into office and didn't really do anything to help those blue collar workers, actually what he did was give more tax breaks to the wealthy, but he went after those public sector workers. And, you know, that that was something that, you know, at least some portion of the private sector workers, at least the non-union folks in this state appreciated because they said, well, if the Democratic Party is not going to do anything for me, at least I'll have lower taxes because they're going to stop these public employers. The biggest occupation of which were educators, right? University professors, teachers, you know, we're going to, we're going to be able to kind of uh, take back some of our tax dollars from these folks. So it's, it's, it's perfectly timed, um, you know, and you think about how Trump used a similar playbook, maybe not exactly with public sector employees, but basically saying like, you know, the Democratic Party has catered to these professional class people for too long. I'm going to bring your jobs back. And, you know, you get, I don't know, something in the way of what, five to seven million people who voted for Obama in 2012, who then voted for Trump in 2016. That's enough to swing that election. And why are they doing that? Well, because if you remember, Obama said he was going to do something about those blue collar livelihoods, didn't really do it. So, all right, I guess we'll try Trump, you know, and and I don't want to dismiss that, you know, Trump, there's lots of reasons people voted for Trump, right? I mean, racism, of course, you know, opening the doors to white supremacy in some cases, but it's those other people, the, those people who were disaffected by the political system and the, really the education myth in many ways that I think we have to pay attention to uh, if the Democratic Party or anyone else is going to kind of rebuild the kind of coalition coalition necessary to move our country in a better direction. There's, I mean, you, we, should, we shouldn't forget um, the basket of deplorables line by, by yep. Clinton. And, and not only – she, first of all, is associated with NAFTA because of her husband, right, because of a good old bill. Yep. Uh, but the basket of deplorables is related to what you talk about in the book with regard to not only is there this economic advantage for if you have the skills and you and you and you were successful because of the education that gets you to advance, but also there's a social esteem connected, right? And there, there's a there's a, a kind of moral normative marker uh, that kind of harkens back to the days when the poor wasn't an, even an economic category but a moral category, right? And so uh, maybe, maybe talk about that a little bit too, because that that could explain some of these political realities as well, right? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because, um, you know, I'll take uh, the idea of social esteem is something, again, that came from uh, Sandel's book. And when we were talking about meritocracy, I wanted to talk about this. And, you know, the basket of deplorables thing is to to some extent, Clinton gets a little unfairly maligned there. I can't believe I'm taking up for Hillary Clinton. But, (laughs) uh, you know, because, because really what she was saying was a version of what I just said, which is that, you know, some of these people, about I think she kind of said half of them actually. She said like half of these people are people that just don't know where to turn. 
Uh, they're looking for other kinds of alternatives. And then the other half are the basket of deplorables, right? I mean, the, the, the white nationalists, et cetera. Um, but that's, but again, like when you, that's the kind of red meat that the right can take and say, no, you're saying that anybody who would think about voting for Trump is a deplorable. And, you know, given some of the other things that happened, you know, um, telling, saying that she was going to put a lot of coal mines out of business in West Virginia, um, you know, again, without, without, I know the argument was that she was going to, you know, have green jobs for these folks, but you know, that's not how blue collar people necessarily see this, right? I mean, they, economic security is such a profoundly important thing in people's lives as is to go back to the idea of social esteem, the idea that, uh, working people can, um, be able to make a contribution every day to their community. And that's what work is in a lot of ways, right? It's deeply rooted, especially in a place like West Virginia, in spite of all the inequalities in their labor politics. You know, th this is something that matters to people culturally. The idea that, you know, you don't have to be a, a college professor to do something that's profoundly important to your community and that community matters in the first place. So like one of the books I talk a lot about in, in my book is, uh, Richard Florida and, you know, the idea of the creative class, which I think is really important because what, what Florida basically argued and, you know, probably made, I don't know, millions of dollars on the lecture circuit doing this was that, um, community as it had existed in American history was essentially irrelevant. That the people that mattered were the creative class types, which was like, even by his estimation, 25, 30% of the population who were moving to new cities, uh, wanted wanted amenities and and to have the city be their playground and and that's the kind of communities we should think about building. But what about all those people in like West Virginia or the people? I grew up in Mississippi. You know, my family members in Mississippi who have lived there their entire lives, who you know feel like they should be able to stay where they are and live in their community and also have economic security. And that is something that the Democratic Party has for too long ignored. Biden in his last State of the Union address, I don't know if somebody was advising him on this, but for the I was I was encouraged to hear this because he actually said some version of this. He said, you shouldn't have to move to be able to get a good job. I have not ever heard a Democratic president say that in my lifetime. That that I mean, in, in spite of whatever criticisms I have of Biden, that's a profoundly important thing to say. So somebody somewhere is telling him to pay attention to this. Maybe they read my book. I don't know, but it wasn't out yet. <laughs> yeah. It's I mean, speaking of, you know, in our last few minutes here, uh, speaking of more positive stuff, um, you know, you, you, you mentioned in the book a little bit about, you know, the, the, the sort of off cast, the, the, the failure of the mass higher education push. I mean, the fact is that, you know, I mean, in the 19th century, almost nobody went to college. I mean, we're talking like single digit right. percentages of the population in the, in the, in the early century, at least now it's like 30, 40, I mean, even 50% of, uh, young people nowadays go to college. It's a really mass phenomenon now. And the, the fact, like this promise of go to college, get a good job, have, you know, like a secure economic life has turned out to be complete bullshit for, you know, a, <laughs> yep. a, a huge fraction of that population. You have downwardly, downwardly mobile uh, population of, of highly educated people, um, you know, with, they're, with tons. They're, 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 they're all organizing at Starbucks right now, by the way. Right. A lot of them. Well, no, see, that's what I was, I was uh, getting at with that, was that, you know, you have potentially, it seems to me like a sort of alliance between the sort of traditional blue collar population of uh, mine workers or, uh, you know, construction laborers or, or whoever. And, you know, this, this new precariat or whatever of, of folks who have a college degree, but they're, they're driving a Uber or they're working like adjunct jobs at a, at a university at a like horrendously exploitative uh, uh, situation. And just this, the, the fact that like uh, going in on education uh, is it it just turned out to be a complete uh, a sham, you know, that, that, that you, you can't actually have a population of people that's like 40 percent lawyers and, um, you know, sociologists and and, you know, whatever. 
uh, nothing wrong with studying law or sociology, of course, but just to say that, like, as an economic matter, this was always the pop the the problem. In fact, but by, by the way, that the, the like, oh, learn to code. We're seeing this right now. Oh, oh, that this is a guaranteed high paying job. Eighteen year old, you should the the labor market returns over the next forty years, and learning to code will definitely be very good. Oh, uh, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates a little bit. The whole tech sector is absolutely shitting itself inside out. And all the learning. I don't know what you're talking about, Ryan. (laughs) Obviously, the Silicon Valley types know exactly what the market's going to do. Like they're very, very good at anticipating that. And this same thing happened with law students. And it's it's happened, you know, in in decades past, like nursing. You know, so there's not infinite capacity to to, uh, absorb these problems. And then suggests you know the 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 fact that like the government needs to actually just set up an economy such that every single person can get a job regardless of, of i thought you were leading with something hopeful ryan what are you doing you're making me more depressed <laughs> sorry where, where but, is but, this headed speak speak to this to, to set aside my digressions here speak speak to this population you know that you that you mentioned in your epilogue there like the 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 yep. the high, uh, educated folks who are are kind of like on the political forefront of you know organizing for a more egalitarian economy for everyone and not doing the professional class bullshit from the 1980s of just grabbing for themselves. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, to go back to something you said a minute ago, I I like the I I would like to imagine a world where 40% of the population were sociologists. That would be fascinating. That's absolutely. <laughs> That's right. Just everybody Great. questioning everything all the time. <laughs> um, but, but no, I, I you know, th- there's for, t- for too long, there's been this kind of idea of upward mobility at the center of American politics, right? And it's, it's impossible if like n- not every person can be upwardly mobile yep. or, Right, because upward mobility presupposes that somebody is below you. Yeah, um, right. we don't so want that. We, as, as leftists, <laughs> as leftists, we want just like one floor. You know what I mean? We don't want that many right. stairs to go up. The inequality right. is the problem. Right, right. Um, but you know, young people are, are again, and, and this is one of the reasons I wrote the book. Actually, um, I, I started writing this book even before Trump was elected. The Trump election was a big part of why I was interested in this. But the other reason was because. I was teaching undergraduates and still still do, of course, and, you know, heard their perspectives on what they thought was going to happen in the future. And they all had this idea, like, I have to go to college, This, but, but it didn't guarantee them anything. It was their kind of one shot. And even that didn't guarantee. So they were going to have all this debt and not to mention the opportunity cost of, you know, being in college for four or five years or whatever um, and still not have any guarantees of a good job. But they also felt like that was something they had to do. And so that's one of the reasons I, I got interested in this because I was like, how is it that we've gotten to this point? And I think what's fascinating about younger people, and again, you see it with the Starbucks workers who are organizing, uh, many of whom are either in college. I mean, in Green Bay, we have a Starbucks that voted to, to unionize just last year. Many of the workers there are students at UW-Green Bay, right? I mean, so um, it's it's fascinating to see. But th- this new generation of, of, of folks, they – understand in a, in a visceral way, right. In a, in a way that maybe people who are a little older than me, let's say, uh, might be able to kind of understand this intellectually, but this younger group, they like, they understand viscerally that this promise, uh, this thing that they're promised with the education myth is, is, is not there. And so consequently they're not looking to get upwardly mobile. They're looking to build solidarity because they understand that's that's what's actually going to give them a better future. And so, you know, in, in spite of my pessimism at the end of the book, I, I or in this maybe in, in this conversation, I'm actually very optimistic. Um, and maybe it's just the old sort of Gramscian optimism of the will thing, but 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 I am but I am optimistic because I think one of the things we've seen over the past five or six years is this education myth has been cracking, right? I mean, both parties, Bernie Sanders on the left, of course, uh, Trump and whatever it is that's going on in the Republican Party at these days, they've been cracked open in a way that like hasn't existed for like 20 or 30 years or, or right, actually 50 years or so, right? But, um, but you know, what's what, what I think it's both scary in the sense that, I mean, to go back to DeSantis for a minute, I mean, 
this, you know, th- these are there. I'm not going to say outright that he's a fascist, but there are like fascist tendencies, right? And we can like, say it, Ryan. Would you like to say it? I'll say it. One of us can say it. <laughs> I don't. No, no. Actually, John, John Gads has a nice piece actually about how he's like a authoritarian, you know, in, in kind of the style think, of Orban. I, I think he's less fascist than Trump in ter- like in terms of structure. Uh, he does not have the sort of uh, populist, yeah. demagogic, rabble rousing right. juice that yeah, Trump yeah. has. That's very important for yes. fascism. But he's That's more true. he's more like Orban in Hungary, and that does not mean that he is any less dangerous than Trump. It may right. mean That's he's right. worse. That's, uh, yeah, I, I I I like I like that. That's that's good. And and so. It's worrisome because because things have been cracked open, right? We weren't worried about like George H. W. Bush, you know, like <laughs> inter- intervening in the kinds of things people could teach in schools, but but yeah, like so that this this rightward trajectory is very much a possibility. It's very worrying, but I think there's also new uh, you know kind of alternatives on the left, and and I think what needs to happen is. We have to have more people organize in unions. There has to be labor law reform at some point. Yeah. But those people have to – it's a lot of work, but not just organize in unions, but they have to do things like run for office, push existing politicians, especially Democrats, to be better. But I, but I think our political assumptions have been um, – you know, the, 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 it's, they're completely wide open now, I think, in ways that they weren't before. So I am optimistic, especially with this generation of younger people who are organizing. I, I think there's a real chance, uh, especially when you bring in the real imperative for to do something about climate change at the same time, you know, for us to move in a much more social democratic direction. So, so that's where I kind of conclude here is with optimism. Frankly, if I were just pessimistic about this, I wouldn't have written the book because – you know, uh, why put in all the effort to, to write something that's just an intellectual exercise? I, I, I you yeah. know, I, I really yeah. do believe that this stuff should be something that we can organize around or it's not that it doesn't matter. If, if you don't mind, John, I, first of all, props, I don't, you know, we're going to out you now that you, not only are you the, the, the fantasy football champion of the left <laughs> anchor uh, fantasy football league, you know, defeating such giants oh, as very, Maximilian Alvarez, you know, very but, hard fought. <laughs> but that Gramscian phrase, optimism of the will. That, yep. that was that. Go ahead. Tell, tell everyone. What, how does that relate to fantasy football? Uh, well, that was that was my fantasy football team name. At least I don't <laughs> think I think my first season, my losing yeah, season, you're, you're when, losing. Max, when, when Max Alvarez <laughs> got uh, Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase just That's completely right. went off in the playoffs, even though I think I was better than him during the regular season. <laughs> <laughs> Not a meritocracy after revenge. all. Yeah, <laughs> no, uh, but I, I got my revenge. Last year, I think my team was named Woke Mob, which I thought was pretty good. <laughs> uh, nice kind of Aaron Rodgers tie-in. And I was victorious. I, I kind of snuck into the playoffs, but had a hot playoffs and, and ended up, uh, ended yeah. up uh, being the champion. Optimism so. of the will and Woke Mob. But okay, so my last question for you, if you don't mind. Uh, I, I want to return because one insight, uh, one of many insights of your book uh, that I think is under-discussed is not just, you know, we, we've – gone over how uh, harmful it is to make education this kind of neoliberal thing that puts the moral and economic responsibility on the individual and how it's about job training, et cetera, et cetera. We talked a little bit about how education properly understood is tied into, um, you know, the function of political independence and, and, and kind of uh, helps people become uh, more active citizens who fight against power and for uh, liberation for working people. But, you know, I'm thinking of like Du Bois is the souls of black folk, you know, and his critique of like Booker T. Washington and, and vocational education and so forth. Yep. Uh, maybe we can talk a bit about like what education really should be in, in a social democratic or socialist mindset, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm so glad you asked this question because, you know, one of the things I've had to say when I've been talking about this book is, you know, because I, I talk about it so much, right, that like I was in a I was in a grocery store recently and was talking to somebody about it, but that's less weird than it sounds. They, they were somebody I kind of knew and they were like, what have you been up to? And I'm talking about the book and they were like, so are you anti-education then? And I was like, no, 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 I'm not anti-education. Like, let's make sure that that's really clear. I'm not anti-education. You know, um, what education should do. And, and I don't want to romanticize the history of American education, right? I mean, in, in the 19th century, for example, that time I was talking about this citizen, this, you know, education for democracy kind of moment, uh, African-American people were excluded from virtually every school. Um, 
girls, girls were educated, but especially in the, in the very early part of the 19th century, they were educated because they were going to like train the next generation of, of Republican men. Right. So like, we're not talking about an equal society here, but the, the germ of that idea is important, which is that education should be about more than job training. And when I think about education and what it should do, and I think a lot about this because I'm, th- I'm, I'm constantly trying to like, you know, uh, advise my students and actually how to get a job, right? I mean, there's an actual reality of the, the conditions they're living in, but also how to get the most out of their experience here at a place like UW Green Bay, especially since many of them are first gen students, et cetera. What education should do is it should be about opening as many doors for you as possible. It should be about enhancing your, I think Danielle Allen talks about this when she talks about education. She, she talks about it as, as enhancing your sort of human, I don't know if she uses this exact word, but this is basically what right? she's saying. Yeah, your, yeah. your human potentialities, yeah, capacities, right? Um, and, and that's what education should do, right? I mean, it, it should be about helping people to understand the political system around them so that they can be informed voters. It should give them information literacy, especially now so that they can kind of navigate these social media worlds and, and all the, not what Trump calls fake news, but the real fake news that's out there. Um, and, and, and yeah, like it should also do things to give people skills if, if they want to have particular jobs. If somebody wants to be a welder, they should be able to go to a trade school and be able to do that. You know, if somebody wants to be an engineer, they should be able to go to college and do that. Um, they should also be exposed to other things that they might see as valuable, even if they don't initially kind of see that. So like working people in the 19th century, they subscribe to these like things called uh, ly- lyceums, lycia, right? I guess is the, is the plural. Like where, Lincoln's, you know, Lincoln's have, Lyceum address, famous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You would have, you know, speakers come in and talk to, to working people about all kinds of different things. And it was just about expanding their horizons and learning more about the world. Those kinds of things should be open to people and, and open to everybody. And th- this is the, the thing that's really important about economic security. If we have the kind of world where everybody who wants a good job with union rights and healthcare and housing, if everybody has all of those needs met, right, then the education system can be devoted to unlocking all of those different human potentialities and allowing people to do what it is that they're really interested in while also helping them to be successful in the labor market. We can do all of those things, but it all comes down to like reframing how we think about what a society should do and who it should be for and what the, and who the government should be for. And if we focus at root, at root on the economic security piece and, and ensure that everybody has that and the social esteem that comes with a contribution every day, then our education system can be so great for, and, and, and be, you know, what anybody really kind of wants it to be for them. Fantastic. I think we need a new category, not just champagne socialists, where champagne is for everyone, but champagne and Shakespeare socialists. Okay. We need like champagne like and lot. Shakespeare for everyone. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the lesson of uh, like Finland is that if your uh, wage economy, your your income is super equal across society, the test scores go up, baby. So, you know, win win. <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, that, that's honestly, I don't, I don't know about you, John, but one of my pitches to students who come to me are like, how do I get a job? Because they, they all felt this pressure and they think if I major in that and then I double major in that and I have a minor in this, that will exactly lead me to do this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and yep. I say, how about you just like, what do you enjoy? Like, take courses and figure out what you like. And, and I make the, I, I fit this pitch, which is actually about wonder and learning for its own sake. I, I make it functional for them. I'm like, here, l- let me tell you the things that you enjoy. You won't find it as boring. You're more likely to do the reading. You're more likely to be interested. You're more likely to get good grades. You're more likely to get the good job. Like I, I do a mm-hmm. whole thing mm-hmm. that it's actually more practical for them to just That's like great. search out for liberal arts. Uh, general. Anyway. Yeah. Well, you've got to, you've got to then sort of fight through the ideology that they've been told, especially first generation students, right? The ones that don't have parents advising them that like you go and you major in the thing that's going to get you a job. And it's like, no, actually, actually most people don't do it. Most people aren't getting jobs in in what their major is, you know? And, you know, so, so don't add it, don't add 25 (laughs) majors and minors. You don't need any of that stuff. Find something you're interested in. Yeah. I study That's chemistry. It. I haven't touched chemicals and uh, well, not industrial <laughs> chemicals anyway. <laughs> I suppose we're all chemicals at the end of the day. Big bag of chemicals. That's true. But 
Oh, this has been great. Thanks so much for joining us, Sean. Uh, I hope, you know, you come back again soon. Not forcing you to write a new book all of a sudden, but, you know, just come on, <laughs> come on and, and chat. Yeah, no, th- no, this this has been fun, and maybe we can even do like a, a yearly fantasy football debrief, that kind of <laughs> Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. We'll have Max on to defend himself, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, John Shelton, the book is called The Education Myth, How Human Capital Trumps Social Democracy. Uh, We'll link to it in the description. Uh, Thanks for coming on the program. Yeah, thanks, guys. This has been a lot of fun. Really appreciate the conversation. Cheers. Absolutely. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you in the next episode.